Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. We're going to begin the news at 5 with the weather. Rain pushing through Metro Detroit tonight on Storm Tracker 4. Here's a live look now from our Windsor Skycam, and we've seen a mix of rain and clouds for the past few hours. And of course, the rain here just in time for the evening commute and the start of the weekend. Yeah, let's get over to Brett Collar for an update. And Brett, some parts of town under a flood advisory right now. Yeah, just issued by the National Weather Service a short time ago. The heaviest rain has been falling in parts of Washtenaw and Wayne counties, so flood advisory remains in effect until 6:15 this evening for them. Storm Tracker 4, you can still see where the heaviest rain is falling. Now also notice this batch right along 96 in the Brighton area, not moving much. That is almost stationary, but is weakening. The heaviest rain here is slowly moving. We'll zoom in a little bit closer so that you can see where the heaviest rain is falling. Southern Washtenaw County, also in the parts of Southern Wayne County at this hour as well. Again, it hasn't been moving much, but the last few minutes, this is all from an outflow boundary that's been slow picking up so this is moving at, at about 10 maybe 15 miles per hour so it's not moving very fast but in the meantime it's dropping a good deal of rain so for those of you and maybe in the next little bit Dundee in just about uh, 35 minutes or so not moving very fast but it does weaken this evening and then we dry out just in time for what should be a nice weekend we'll detail that in just a bit Hey, Brett, our other top story tonight. New questions surrounding the man who shot and killed Detroit police officer Lauren Quartz. Specifically how he got that assault rifle and his run ins with the law leading up to that deadly encounter. Let's get to Rod Maloney, who spoke to the owner of the gun shop where that gun was bought. Good evening, Rod. Yeah, good evening, Jason and Kimberly. Uh, before Money Mac Jones, uh, make that a Money Mac Davis opened fire on Joy Road on Wednesday night. He made himself known to East Point Police on a fairly regular basis over the last couple of years. And as we look back now, we're learning more about how he evaded the system to get that Draco rifle. Just after New Year's 2021, East Point police arrest Amani Davis with a taser. He winds up charged with a misdemeanor, improper possession of a firearm in a vehicle. Davis pleads guilty, gets a year's probation. Last May 30th, East Point police get a call to Davis's home. Macomb County Prosecutor Pete Lucido tells Local 4 Davis's own mother had had it with his behavior problems and threw her son out of the house. Imani ended up arrested for a domestic disorderly complaint. City attorney charged him and Davis ended up released on a $500 bond. He was supposed to appear in court on June 2nd. We do not know if he appeared. Lucido tells Local 4 on June 9th, a grad party gets shot up at a drive-by with a 9mm pistol. No one hit or hurt. East Point police find a discarded gun, send it and recovered bullets to the MSP lab in Lansing. June 22nd, the warrant request screened by Lucido's office, an eyewitness says that he sees Davis get rid of the gun. July 7th, weapons charges get authorized against Davis, carrying concealed, a felony, felony firearms, reckless use, which is a misdemeanor, and tampering with evidence, a four-year felony. It was typed up but not processed. Because of a lack of evidence, no assault with intent to murder charge was issued. A month ago, Davis apparently purchased a Draco rifle, similar to this one, at Action Impact of East Point. DPD saying he was with another person at the time. Action Impact owner Bill Cusick says the other person did not purchase the gun. If somebody else came in and bought it on his behalf, that would be a straw purchase. I don't believe that's what occurred here, but I don't know. I'm not privy to all of the investigation. Now, Cusick did tell us that the sale was legal, that a background check was done through the FBI, as is the normal process for the purchaser. It was likely Davis, and he was deemed eligible to purchase the gun without any kind of a felony showing up on his record. That's how that happened. The gun runs about $1,100. And I was told by a police source today that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms did, in fact, interview the person who was with Davis on the day that that purchase was made. Back to you. Yeah, uh, boy, a lot to run down there. And, Rod, what do we know about the felony warrant that wasn't served? Well, the felony warrant ended up being typed up eventually, but it was, it, as often happens with these things, it takes about seven to ten business days for it to get processed, and then it needs to go out and be served. And one of the problems for that, even if they had had that warrant typed up, which it was not ready uh, for police uh, before the 7th, 
is that they would have to have found him and they did not know where he was. So Pete Lucido saying that the system works the way it works. It was slow and it, it could, you know, it, it needed to go quicker, but they were also waiting for evidence from Michigan State Police and that took more time, which made it so that that warrant did not get served yeah. until it did not get actually typed up until the 7th. Interesting that that happened a day after this all went down. All right, Rod, thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, he's been out of prison for less than two years, and now ex-Detroit Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick is under the Fed's microscope once again. This time, it's his request for donations to buy an $800,000 condo and his failure to pay back any of the money he owes to the city of Detroit. Grant Herms is live tonight with how the Feds plan to go after it. Grant? Well, good evening. Now, this investigation and these new court documents come 18 months after Kilpatrick's sentence was pardoned, meaning he was released from his 28-year sentence in prison. But either way, pardon or not, he will have to pay the money that he owes. Kwame Kilpatrick's name back on a federal court docket after prosecutors open an investigation into whether he's been paying the money he owes the city of Detroit and the IRS. New court documents show U.S. Attorney Don Eisen is asking PayPal and Plum, the startup investment banking app, to garnish the accounts of both Kilpatrick and his wife Letitia, saying they owe more than $193,000 in restitution without post-judgment interest. He was originally ordered to pay more than $1.7 million. The investigation is a routine part of cases like Kilpatrick's, according to a spokesperson from the U.S. Attorney's Office. Local 4 did try to reach Kilpatrick, but there was no attorney information listed on the filing. Kilpatrick and his wife are now listed as the founders of Movemental Ministries in Georgia, posting videos like this one on Instagram Friday morning, less than a day after the investigation was filed. You know what time it is. It's time for Bible study. Let's talk about who we really are in Jesus Christ. They also recently started a fundraiser online where they were reportedly asking for $8,000 donations to buy an $800,000 home in a gated community in Orlando, Florida, using that Plum account. That request is no longer on the site. He's also begun selling copies of his book where he describes himself as chained like a wild animal while in prison. I'm looking for Mr. Kilpatrick. Is he around? Unfortunately, no, he is not. We did call Kilpatrick's ministry today, but we were told he could not be reached. Now, we did leave a way for the former mayor to get in touch with us, but he did not call us back this afternoon. And not only was that account on that Plum Fund uh, site taken down, the account in general is totally gone. That site now redirects you to the Plum Fund homepage. Back to you. Interesting. Well, Grant, what's next for this investigation here? Well, this investigation will continue into whether Kilpatrick is hiding any other assets like he has admitted to in the past, or a judge will decide whether or not to garnish money from those two accounts. It's something that we'll just have to wait and yep. see. We Back know you. you'll continue to follow it. Grant, we appreciate it. Today, former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe assassinated after being shot at a campaign event. Incredibly shocking video here. The 67-year-old was shot from behind while giving a stump speech for a candidate in Japan. You won't see it, actually. The camera kind of falls here. Uh, police arrested the suspected gunman immediately at the scene. Abe was later pronounced dead at the hospital despite emergency treatment that included massive blood transfusions. This is shocking. Uh, it's uh, profoundly disturbing uh, in and of itself. Uh, it's also such a strong personal loss for so many people. Police say the suspect is a 41 year old man who admitted to shooting Abe. He was Japan's longest serving leader before stepping down in 2020. Today, President Biden signed a new executive order aimed at protecting access to reproductive care. It comes two weeks after the landmark Supreme Court decision overturning Roe versus Wade. Here, a look, here's a look at what's in, or in the order and where it falls short. In the wake of the downfall of Roe versus Wade, the president has no power to restore a nationwide right to an abortion. I can tell you what I know. But in a fiery speech, the president going after the conservative majority Supreme Court and Republicans, vowing to do all in his power to protect and expand reproductive care. We cannot allow an out of control Supreme Court working in conjunction with extremist elements of the Republican Party to take away freedoms and our personal autonomy. 
Following the controversial ruling from the nation's highest court, nearly a dozen states banning abortion, and more states are expected to make abortion harder to access or outright ban it soon. What we're witnessing is a giant step backwards in much of our country. The new order, the White House claims, will safeguard access to services including the abortion pill and emergency contraception, plus pushing to protect the privacy of patients. Some Republicans hitting back against the executive order on social media, and the order also doesn't go as far as many activists and Democrats had hoped. The president urging Congress to act. The fastest way to restore Roe Ro, is to pass a national law codifying Roe. The president instead calling on Americans to vote in more pro-abortion rights lawmakers. For God's sake, there's an election in November. Vote, vote, vote. Now, here in Michigan, a 1931 law banning abortion has been temporarily blocked in court, but the battle over that is still far from over. A pivotal day in Washington is former Trump White House counsel Pat Cipollone is questioned by the January 6th committee. Cipollone appearing in person but behind closed doors today to testify. The committee is looking for Cipollone to corroborate what other witnesses have said. The committee likely asking about his threats to resign over false claims of election fraud and if he warned Mr. Trump about legal consequences for not stopping the riot. Pat Cipollone was perfectly comfortable letting these hearings go by without testifying until pressure became too much. Cipollone's testimony is on video for the committee to potentially use in an upcoming hearing. The next one is Tuesday morning. Ford expanding a recall of SUVs for possible engine fires. Ford says owners should park their SUVs outside after a series of engine fires that can happen even when the ignition switch is off. The company announced today a recall of another 100,000 SUVs. Back in May, the company recalled nearly 39,000 Ford Expedition SUVs in the United States. We'll have much more on the recall coming up on Local 4 News at 6 o'clock. Miguel Cabrera has been selected to play in the 2022 All-Star Game. This was cool to see. Commissioner Rob Manfred announcing <laughs> Cabrera along with Albert Pujols got special nods because of their career achievements, although Miggy is having a pretty good year. It'll be his 12th All-Star Game selection. Both Pujols and Cabrera are two of the three players in history with 3,000 hits, 500 home runs, and 600 doubles. Mm -hmm.